PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacity. These licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar website or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com, to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides educational and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money you can't afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously, and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, game on. Now, let's see. Do the sharing screen thing, and we'll in good shape. Um, what am I doing wrong? Here we go. There we go. Let's see. Bring up the chat box. There we go. Cool. Things are moving along right quite nicely. All right. So it's a fun day in the market. We're down a bit. Uh, the only thing I played today, like, was a little bit of an EK shorting back back when it was around here at 25, but it was a wimpy play because I only need 350 on it. Um. And the rest of you just been watching stuff full. Now, don't forget, we have a ton of short bets in the short-term portfolio. So it's not like, you know, it's not like we, there's no point in betting the future short if you're already short in your portfolio. See, it's one of the, you know, one of the things you should be using the futures for is to balance yourself out. So it's like if you think the market's going up and you're short in your portfolio, it's a good time to go long in the futures to make up the money and vice versa. So it's kind of a little quick balance. Um, if you if you get caught wrong footed, rather than jumping in and out of positions constantly, because easy there's very low friction getting in and out of futures position. Now check out gasoline. Gasoline plowed right through two dollars. I mean, it had a little bit of support here, but then it just like went plunk. See, yeah, see, here's it holding the two dollar line from eleven o'clock until about twelve thirty ish, and then boom, fell right off the table. And now it's heading to new new lows again. That's that just shows you how totally fake all this run-up was. This is all bullshit into the long weekend. And this is how they screw the consumers. Now, remember, we went long at $2. Last, in fact, last week, that was our play, was to go long on gasoline into the weekend, right? So we went long at $2, and it's $420 per point. So um, we got out at 206 That was our target. We weren't expecting it to go higher than 206 But 206 pays like $2,400, $2,500 for 206 And... Um, you know, it's a really, really great play. You can do it into a holiday weekend. Betting gasoline is going to get jacked up is an incredible play. But as you can see, the whole move was completely fake. You know, it's a little scary of betting it short after the holiday weekend because, you know, you never know. It might go up or whatever. Something else could happen. But betting it, betting long into a holiday weekend, that's a fantastic play because they are going to screw the consumers every single time and get as much money as they possibly can out of them. Um all right. <clears throat> Anyone have questions or anything? I have no topic today. I'm just sort of watching the market. Um, there's uh, not too much interesting stuff going on, but I'll just ramble on unless somebody has something to say. Is anybody besides Eric even alive out there? Eric's, ch Eric's chatting privately, so you guys wouldn't even know Eric's talking. <laughs> Let me see something. Oh, it says there's people out there. There's Jal. All right. One person's alive. Oh, so we, we um, this is important, though. Okay, let's talk about that. So what just happened? In our chat room, yeah, right? I, I thank you. I, me too, Pat. I had a great weekend. I mean, I just like, you know, we went to Atlantic City. I saw the Who concert. We hung out, met some friends, and it was nice. <laughs> I was like... I usually have just a completely relaxing, no responsibility weekend, but that was a good one. So I, I was in no mood to come back, I'll tell you that. 
But here I am. All right. Or as I should probably say, oh, I'm so glad to be back with you guys. All right. <laughs> I do love this. I mean, thank God this is my job where I'd be bored crazy. But, you know, I love doing this job. But it's just sometimes it's just I'm like, you know, I'd like to take a two-week vacation or something like that once in a while. All right. Let's see. Wait, wait, dances, dances. Um, so here's the thing. This is a really easy call to make. The first time, where the hell was it? <sighs> Hang on. Sorry about that. Professional webinars. All right. No, no. Oh, am I not? Am I crazy? I could have sworn we set some levels. What? Oh, here it was. It was way back at, it was at 12 o'clock. So at 12 o'clock, when we hit 2,100 on the um, S&P, oh, yeah, it was a while ago. So when we hit 2,100 on the S&P, I called and I said there were going to be bounces, right? <clears throat> it's really easy because when you hit a huge significant line like 2,100 on the S&P that you know is going to be bouncy, that's when all you have to do, this is a 5% rule. And the 5% rule is basically telling you that you're going to get a bounce or a retrace. If it's, if it's going up, it's called a retrace. If it's going down, it's a bounce. That's the only difference. But it's basically a retrace of the run. And the retrace is going to be 20% will be a weak retrace. And 40% will be a strong retrace. So what's 20%? So in other words, in the S&P, we fell from 2120. All right, let's get on a slightly better view. Okay. Here's the 2120 line over here. So we fell from 2120. The consolidation point is what you always look for, not this tie, not the low, the point where it seemed to be consolidating. <clears throat> so we pull back a little, and you can see there's a very huge consolidation along 2120. Then it gyrates, then it snaps, right? Consolidation gets a little wild, and that's what happens. It gets a little wild, swings up and down before it snaps one way or the other definitively. But we got the fall from 2120 to 2100. We know 2100 is huge support on the S&P. So how much on the 5% rule then? If you have a, if you ever drop, an, and it's not about the 20 point drop, don't forget 20 point drop is 1%. So that's obviously going to be significant anyway. So, a, but even, but especially as it's a 1% drop into a big fat line like 2100, you're like, you could almost bet the farm that you're going to get some kind of a, a bounce there, or at least, or at least the way oil fell, I'm sorry, the way gasoline fell at the $2 line, you would at least expect to have a little bit of support before it fails, right? So basically what we noted at 12 o'clock is that it was going to bounce, and it was going to bounce how much? Well, four points, 20% of the 20-point move is four points. So four points is a weak bounce, all right? And if you see it go up four points, you say, well, that's nothing. Here's 2104, right? Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Whoops, too much. All right, so here we are at 12 o'clock. And we're getting a weak bounce to 2104. That's a weak bounce. We expect that bounce. That's not a sign of strength. It's only a sign of a bounce. Okay, when a ball hits the floor, it's going to bounce, right? But if you're going to make a bet on what the ball is going to do going forward, you're going to say, well, it's kind of going to trickle along the floor because it doesn't have any more energy. It's going to bounce once, maybe twice, but it's running out of energy. That's a sign of a ball bouncing. Now, if, now if, the, if, the, if the stock market is acting like a ball that's running out of energy, that's not a good sign, right? That's not a sign that the stocks are strong. If the stocks are strong, if the stocks have thrust of their own, this is like physics, if the stocks have their own thrust behind them, then they should overcome the, the physics of a weak bounce and a strong bounce. You understand what I'm saying? So in other words, if you, if you drop a ball, like if it's a Super Bowl, and you drop it, they bounce about 50, they, they, they bounce sometimes like 50% of the way up. If you drop a Super Bowl on the floor, it'll drop about halfway. Or maybe a basketball, I guess, is a better example. So a basketball will drop, if you drop it, it might come up like about 50%. But the next time, it's going to bounce back down and do another 50%. So the next time, it'll only bounce 25%. Then the next time, if you were watching it closely, it bounces 12.5%. Each time, it loses about half of its bounce. And that's because there's nothing in the ball to give it energy. Okay, if you push the ball down, 
In other words, if there's an artificial force pushing the ball down, your hand dribbling the ball, you can push it down with enough force so that when it does bounce, it bounces all the way back to your hand because you put the force on that caused the bounce. So when a, when a stock, when an index, when, a, when a, so anything you're looking at, when it goes down, if it goes down artificially, it's going to come back harder. So if it goes down for a bad reason, not, it was, I don't want to say a bad reason. It goes down for not a natural uh, decline. So in other words, a not a natural decline could be there was bad news, there were people panicked about something, the dollar did something, an outside influence, some outside influence caused it to go down. Then you would see it recover faster than gravity. So basically what we say is gravity is a weak bounce is gravity and a strong bounce is gravity. Um, if a stock can't even make a strong bounce, if it can't make a 40% retrace of the drop that it had, then it's, then it's very likely that it's going to continue to go lower, not higher. It's going, to, it's going to continue to test that support until something else acts on it. So either the support, something else acting means either there's a positive uh, force and acts on it, like something good happens and it goes back up, or uh, uh, something negative happens like the floor crumbles, like the support gives out. All right, so it's, it's all you're watching. You know, you, you look at these lines and you think they're meaningless, but that's, that's what's happening. It's just as a, if there's not money flowing into something, it's going to run out of gas, right? It's, gonna, it's not going to be able to sustain the heights, especially if the heights are not natural. There's a, there's a natural equilibrium that a stock's going to find at a certain point. There's a certain price where an equilibrium sets in where the buyers and the sellers agree that that's about the right price for the stock, right? So... With Apple, it's about 130 bucks, 120 bucks, in, you know, somewhere in the range of 125 bucks. Apple's at an equilibrium right now, and um, it can go a little higher, it can go a little lower, but it's generally going to stay in that channel until something really changes. Um, certain stocks, you can see exactly where that channel is. Other stocks are crazy. Now, this market's very, very artificial. There's all kinds of weird forces acting on things, which gives you some very weird readings. But still, and again, this goes back to my whole proposition about stocks, is that stocks have a certain value to me. And I look at things, and I say, if they're too high, they're too high. It's just, it doesn't, I don't care what the chart does. I care if it's actually too high. I know what the price is in, in my head for these stocks. Um, I know what the value of a stock is. So I'm going to buy it when it's high, when it's low, sorry. I'm going to buy it when it's low. I'm going to sell it when it's high. So the S&P right now, the question is, is 2100 the equilibrium point or not? If it is, we're in a pretty strong market. If we can prove that 2100 is very, very tough to beat, and we should see 18,000 here on the Dow is the same line, and um, really I think it's like 1220 on the on the on the uh, Russell. So we're not in terrible shape right now. All we had is a little correction, one percent. There's nothing to it, and we're holding 2100 so far, so it's all good. But we better hold that line, otherwise we're into some serious weakness. And I, and I, you know, I don't count a little move below, but for the next day or two, we need to hold that line and prove that that line is really the new bottom. If we're going to call, it, if we're going to call this a bull market. All right. So now to some questions. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. And Tao says, I wonder what you think of ABX. Do they have an issue with rates going up and gold prices down due to the Greek? Um, ABX has nothing to do with Greece, other than the fact that, of course, if Greece starts collapsing and Europe starts panicking, they're going to buy gold. Um, th this is a good thing to talk about today also. As you can see from these two charts, here's gold, here's the dollar, and there's a reason I have them next to each other all the time. Here goes dollar up, here goes gold down. Here, in fact, here's a chance to test your Super Bowl effect, your Super Bowl effect. The, the, here's the thing. Dollar. So, in other words, gold went down not because anything bad happened to gold. Gold went down because the dollar got stronger and gold is priced in dollars. So, gold goes up. The dollar went up 1.25%. Gold went down 1.3%. So, the only reason gold is down is because the dollar pushed it down. So, now... The question you want to ask yourself is, is the dollar's effect over? Because we don't see any reason gold should be lower. So what you want to say to yourself is, is it possible that the effect of the dollar is now going to subside? Now, what do we know about the dollar? We know, first of all, it was at 100, like a little while ago. That means gold could conceivably go 2.5% lower if the dollar keeps going up to 100. 
but at 100, we would certainly expect the dollar to be rejected. You know, if it ran up from what, 95, it ran up from 94, it'll run up to 100. That's a pretty good sized run. It probably won't even run that far before it pulls back. Um, so even if the euro, even if the Europe's really weak, first of all, the, the euro also you have to look at your facts. The euro is at an all time low. The yen is at an all not an all time, but I mean the euro is at a, at a ten year low. The yen is at a twenty year low right now. <clears throat> so what are the chances that they hit new record lows and new record lows and new record lows for the rest of the week? Probably not, right? So that means at some point this week, gold is almost certainly going to bounce. Since gold is now, now, now at 185, I really think we should have gone long at 185, but we missed that opportunity. But now you can go long at 188. And I'm talking about gold, but ABX is gold. It's just a, ABX is really a proxy for gold. <clears throat> um, I haven't seen you rent out, so I'll tell you, uh, first, of all, first of all, don't chat privately. That's another thing. Chat to all, to always chat to all participants. Um, ABX, there's a lot of moving parts to ABX right now. They're offloading some assets, okay? So they, they're, but, but they're offloading their assets in order that they can buy other assets because, you know, they're constantly changing up their, their portfolio. Um, but the bottom line is they own like 140 million ounces of gold in the ground. 140 ounces of gold, million ounces of gold is $140 billion, but the company's only valued at about $15 billion. Um, and why is that? Well, because first of all, because they have to get the gold out of the ground, and that costs money. So right now, it costs them about a thousand dollars an ounce to pull gold out of the ground. If gold is only twelve hundred dollars an ounce, they're only going to make two hundred dollars times one hundred and forty million is their prospects. And um, and of course, not all the gold is going to be as easily accessible. So probably over the long haul, they're going to make a hundred dollars an ounce. Now, still a hundred dollars an ounce on one hundred and forty billion on one hundred and forty fourteen million one hundred and forty. Million ounces is uh, 140, 1.4, and it's going to be um, 11.4 billion dollars. So they have 11.4 billion dollars of gold in the ground at a profit of 100. Even at these prices, they've still got they still got enough money to make 11.4 billion. Obviously, though, that's not that much, and that's why their value is so low. Gold companies are always priced at sort of today's extraction cost of gold. But in reality, if you're bullish on gold, your leverage by buying a gold company is tremendous because if gold goes up to 2000 an ounce, ABX doesn't – they make instead of $100 an ounce, they make $500 an ounce or $600 an ounce taking it out. So their profits go up six times, not just a little bit. So you get a lot, a lot of leverage on a gold company. Um, also, if you trust your gold company to manage themselves well, like I think ABX does, what you, they're going to do is they're going to take advantage of sell stuff. Like they just sold a mine that was worthless to them. They sold half of the interest to China. The reason they did that, in fact, that was just in the news. So let's take a look. Um, X. Here. So they sell 50% of their uh, Papua New Guinea mine, which is closed at the moment. They can't, they can't get the, um, they can't get environmental things passed. So, you know, they're having problems now. That's another reason to go and partners with the Chinese because the Chinese will bust heads. Okay, probably the Zing, Zijing mining is is going to uh, walk into the uh, Papua New Guinea's uh, government offices and basically say, hey, guess what? We're opening our mine, and they and the New Guinea people are going to be like, yes, sir, because uh, Chinese people don't take crap like American companies do. So they're gonna they're gonna force uh, New Guinea's hand one way or another and get this mine open. So that's one reason to partner up with them. Um, so uh, ABX gave them the mine because because look they gave them the half the mine for three hundred million in cash. That's a lot better than nothing because they already wrote off the whole mine. So now they have three hundred million in free money because they wrote it off already in this mine. It's they they've got billions invested in this mine. So why would they give up half for three hundred million? Because these Chinese guys are gonna get this mine moving and get it profitable and get the gold out of the ground. That's number one. Number two, there's gonna be some quid pro quo quo where ABX gets to now go into China and do a little bit of mining, which is huge for them. Um and so it's talking about that here. They're talking about producing five hundred thousand ounces of gold this year. Okay, 500,000 times 1,000 is $500 million worth of gold in one year. That's really nice, right? Um, so 
and they're also buying a piece of the Ivanhoe mine, blah, blah, blah. So, so ABS is closing up with the Chinese. I, why that would make them go off 1%, I have no idea. I think it's fantastic news. Um, I think there's another. No, that's it. That's the only article. All right, so anyway, I love ABX down here. Um, so let's talk about two things. First of all, let's get back to gold. So at 1188.50, I like gold. You know how I like gasoline last week at two bucks? I like I like gold here at 1188.50. So let's now go to our active screen. We'll do a little futures trade first. We'll change our Nikkei for gold. YG. And we'll buy some. Oh, look at that spread. It's disgusting on gold. Let's see if we can buy one here. Oh, that was way too easy to fill. <laughs> I get nervous when something fills really easily. It means, it means since nobody wanted it. So they're like, oh, here comes a sucker. Um, all right. Let me buy two. So I would really like to have two. But that's that's me. I'd say you know, <laughs> it's not recommended for everybody. And now I'm not going to get it. Now it's running away. They can't believe somebody actually bought one. That's why they. they oh, there it goes. All right. So now I have two at eleven eighty eight. If it drops down, I'm not going. I wouldn't buy at eleven eighty five. But if it drops down to eleven eighty, I'd be very happy to buy two more. Even though I'm going to be you know probably four hundred dollars down or something like that. I'd be thrilled to buy uh, a couple more at a lower strike. Now, see, so I'm going to this trade recognizing the dollar could go higher, could push gold lower, but that's not something I'm going to worry about because I think because we've already seen we've already seen the dollar go up and go go down. We already know that gold bottomed out at uh, like eleven sixty, eleven seventy. So I'm not too worried about the downside here, and I also know that at some point something will happen to spike gold up, and I'm going to get a nice run. So my target here, what's my target? My target's going to be 1,200 because realistically 1,200 is, um, sorry, 1,200 is a, a, a resistance. So, uh, so I'll be happy to get some 1,200. So I'll certainly take one off of 1,200 and then set a tight stop like
you know, you got to look at the makeup of the Dow because it's not what it used to be. In the old days, in the old days, the Dow Jones Industrial Average used to be industrial companies that shipped all their stuff by transport. So the reason that you watched the transports with the Dow was because all the companies in the Dow transported goods. Now, uh, components. So now, who in the Dow transports goods? AXP is a transport. Okay. Boeing's a transport. Caterpillar, their parts go by train, sure. Cisco, no. I wouldn't call that anything to do with transport. Chevron does by pipeline. Oh, Apple, no. Nothing to do with transports other than FedEx delivering their stuff, which is in the Dow. Oh, no, I'm sorry. FedEx isn't in the Dow. Well, you know. <laughs> it used to be. Um, Let's see, Cisco, so we got Chevron, DuPont, no, nothing to do with transports, Disney, nothing to do with transports, GE, yeah, I'd say they make trains, so transports, Financial, Home Depot, transports, yes, because they have a lot of heavy goods that go by train, IBM, no, nothing to do with the transports, Intel, nothing to do with the transports, Johnson Johnson, nothing to do with the transports, J.P. Morgan, nothing to do with transports, Coca-Cola, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I guess they ship their stuff around. McDonald's also kind of ships their stuff around, but not really. The transports are the transports aren't affecting McDonald's one way or the other. 3M, nothing to do with the transports. Merck, nothing to do with the transports. Microsoft, nothing to do with the transports. Nike ships their stuff around, but not really. You know, here's the thing. Nike ships their stuff around, but when you think about it, it's a hundred dollars sneak because it costs them ten cents. It's not the transport costs that are really killing that they're making and breaking Nike's day. Um, it's really the uh, the volume of sneakers they sell. Pfizer, no transports. Procter and Gamble, no transport. Travelers, no transport. So there you see how it's, you see how it's falling apart. United Health, United Tech, Visa, Verizon, Walmart. There, Walmart you'd say has to be transports. They're pushing this stuff around. Exxon, pipelines are not transports. Um, <clears throat> so the Dow's diverge very, very far away from really being dependent on the transport. Therefore, it's not a very good signal, although the health of the transports obviously indicates to some extent the health of commerce. So for that reason, you do watch it. Uh, Adolfo says, why not gold instead of cash? Well, because my cash didn't drop, uh, my, my cash didn't drop uh, 30 bucks today. <laughs> I mean, that gold, gold is scary, man. I think it's going to go up, but I mean, I'm not going to put all my faith in it. Here's gold. Yeah, 30 bucks. So, from 1209 to 1185 or 25 bucks, whatever it is. Um, that's too much. That's a huge move. Now, now, obviously, the cash did go up. So, I think I would rather be in dollars, which I think will get stronger in a crisis, than gold. But I still like gold, and I'm, I'm not saying not to hedge into gold, but I, I, I like my money to be flexible. I like, you know, I like my – look. I like my money to be in my trading account. I don't want it in the bank. I don't want, you know, you can keep your 1% for the bonds or, or, you know, for the overnights and whatever, you know, for the cash or whatever. I don't need the interest, okay? I, I can make a lot, lot more than 1% of my money by making one trade. So I like my money to be ready and in my trading account and ready to go. Not everything, obviously, but, I know, you know, a good amount of cash in a trading account makes me very, very happy because then you have the ability to quickly move and strike and pick up something when something happens. Gold is not liquid enough for me at all. And again, if I want to buy gold, I buy ABX. You know, I could that futures play on gold, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, let's see. Gold. Craig says, so which, what are one or two best positions the portfolio taking advantage of China, Japan, and Greece. Um, well, we, we have we have the FXIs in the short-term portfolio. We have FXI and we have EWJ. Uh, Greece, I'm not playing. Uh, that's just it's too confusing. Um, we've got 20 FXIs now. We're scared to short China, and for good reason. We're already losing money, right? Um, we have 20 of the July 50 FXI puts. We rolled those from the 47s. They ended up costing about 192 overall. That's how much we're in for total on the position. Um, so we're in, we're in uh, 20 of those. That's a small position, but that's because we don't know when China's going to stop. You know, we're betting, we're betting on a bubble popping. Japan, though, because of that 35% thing, I'm willing to put my foot down on Japan, and this one we, we'll press or do whatever. So we're, we're a little more heavily invested in this one than FXI at the moment. Um, I, I, I really, on the whole, just mathematically, I don't see how Japan can possibly sustain itself. 
I don't know if it'll be July, it could be September, it could be next year. At some point, Japan is going to have a huge meltdown, I think. So this position, the, the EWJ puts, I strongly believe in, and I'm willing to press it and willing to put more and more money into it until I get it right. The China, though, how do you bet against something that went up 100% in a year? You know, it could go up 100% again before I'm right. So I, I'll, here, I'm, I, it's like here I'd rather I lose a little bit, take it off the table, roll it up higher, lose a little bit, take it off the table, keep rolling and try to stay in position. But I don't know when China's going to – I don't know when China's going to fall apart. But Japan, I, every every quarter we get through that Japan doesn't melt down, I am amazed. I can't believe they can just keep sustaining this thing. It's just incredible to me. But, you know, but, but here you go. I mean, look, the reason they can sustain it is because everybody else is doing it. It just seems normal. We we accept the fact that these central banks print a trillion dollars a year. It's like, yeah, sure, we, we – they, they, they're saying outright – we, we have QE. We're putting a trillion dollars into the economy this year. And nobody goes, from where? Where is this money coming from? How, are you, where is, it, how is it being made? What do you, where do you get off putting a trillion dollars into the economy? What gives you the right to do this? Nobody says anything. It's just as if like, this is what's supposed to happen. So as long as nobody questions it, they'll keep getting away with it. But when you realize... When you realize how arbitrary the system is, like this thing where the banks are getting uh, convicted for the libel, you know, for the for, for the currency manipulation. Of course, you can manipulate currency because it's completely bullshit anyway. It's a meaningless number. There's no actual value to the currency. It's only the value everyone accepts. Um, it, it, it won't necessarily be Japan. It won't be the yen that falls apart first. But once one of these countries, one of these small countries that aren't in a union and aren't their own major currency, once one of them starts Printing money like Russia is a very possible candidate, actually. Once Russia starts printing money to pay off their debts and they have a currency crisis. So, you know, one of the, one of, one of the decent-sized countries is going to have a currency crisis in the near future. Maybe India also. Um, once something happens and people lose faith in any currency anywhere in the world, all of a sudden people are going to start realizing that all these currencies are the same. Just because it has a nice label on it, it says dollar or yen or whatever or pound doesn't mean anything because there's no backing. We don't have any, there's no standard value, there's no nothing. It's just made up numbers at this point. And in fact, it's not even the paper anymore. They just make it up. They're done by electronics these days. It makes it so much easier for them to just push money through. <clears throat> and by the way, I could I do a whole essay on that. That's a, what's really gone wrong with the system, it used to be when the Fed would, would create money, when the Treasury would create money, they would actually have to basically create bills they create they would print more money at the treasury because someone had to actually physically have the cash to put into something that at least would put money into the system the way they do it now though is because it's electronic there's no actual money being even used anywhere so the money goes directly from the fed into treasury without ever benefiting anybody it just is a book it's a bookkeeping entry bookkeeping entries don't fix economies Nobody gets their hands on that money. How can it improve the economy if no one ever touches it? All it does is it allows the Treasury to pretend that it's okay to borrow another $50 billion or $100 billion next month. You know, I'd like to borrow $50 billion next month, okay? So if somebody wants to hand me $50 billion, I'll find some use for it, and I'll pay you back at 2%. You know what? Because you know, I could take $25 billion, put it aside, pay 2% for 15 years, and I'll be dead by the time. I'll either be dead or, or, or on an island somewhere by the time I have to pay it back. So, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you sit there, and again, that's what politicians think that way. They're like, well, this is somebody else's problem. I'm not going to be here in 15 years. What politician is going to be, is, is expecting to be here in 15 years? They're all going to be retired and on some island somewhere or whatever, and they got so so between now and the complete and also they're all then they're all basically convinced that the system is going to collapse. So if the system is going to go to hell in a handbasket in the next five or ten years, and they know it, then they then they just want to enrich themselves now so that they can get out before it all hits the fan, and they'll be off somewhere. And because believe me, if you're in the top one percent, you know that none of this stuff's going to touch you. Doesn't matter what happens, you'll be fine.
the islands, there's places. You can go anywhere. You can go to different countries. There's, there's so many choices. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I mean, I was reading um, some brochures for different countries. Um, it was one of those destin no, destinations. It was, a, it was a destinations magazine, and I started looking up some of these different countries and, and looking at things. Like I, I kind of have where I'm set. I, I know where I want to go. Uh, I'm looking to go to the um, the Channel Islands and Isle of Jersey and uh, off the UK. Um, but there are other places. So every once in a while, I start looking. I was looking at these different countries and reading and reading different places to go in the world. And it's wonderful. Like Ecuador is amazing. It sounds really great. Panama is actually quite nice. You know, there's always places that you can go. Uh, Belize, of course, is always a good choice. A lot of that's always, you know, people are already raking that over the coals. There's all these great places to go. And if you have a million bucks and you can drop it in a bank account, you can go to so many different countries, they won't ask you a thing. You just you move in right away, and they're happy to have you and your money come stay there. As long as you're liquid. They don't want anybody. If you need a job, they don't want to talk to you. If you have money, they love to have you. And that's, that's just the way it works. So, there's, so the people and, and the people who are in government who are worried about the future, they know that. They know that they, they know they've got to buy that, that place. They know they've got to get they know they've got to get to safety at some point before it all happens. And they'll be long gone. Nobody who who blames them? Who who blames all these officials and all these congressmen and all these senators? You even know the names of the guys who voted you know, in Reagan like look at Reagan's time when we dismantled Social Security and we started and we started all this bullshit with um floating currencies and things like that and all this and we start on this debt trend. The guys who started doing that, who took all the cash in from all their corporate sponsors twenty, thirty what, forty years ago now, those people, who even knows their names? They're gone. They're long since retired. And twenty years ago or whatever, they did it again with the SNL crisis. And those guys all got rich and they got out. And who knows who those people were? A few guys got caught and indicted. And other than that, everybody else got away clean. So of course it's going to go on. We design our government that way. It's made to ha it's made to let that happen. And that's and so all over the world this is happening. It's, and people and you and you see these guys getting caught and indicted because they're so greedy and they're taking so much money that they get caught. But there's a lot of guys who are not getting caught who are doing it quietly and smart. Because as long as it's and and the trick is as long as there's all this money floating around, it's easy to take some. If we were in austerity like the Greek guys are, they can't take any money. That's probably one of the other things that's pissing off all the government guys over there. You can't take any money when there's austerity because every because every penny is being counted. But with our Fed, would you would anyone know if ten, if ten billion dollars was taken out of the out of the out of the uh, thing one day? Nobody would even know. Who the hell? Who can tell? It's not even it's not even a rounding error on their books. Anyway, so not to be yeah, uh, again not to be a downer. I mean, fine because the, you know we can keep going like this. And anyway, we are the investor class. We're the ones that are winning. <laughs> All this is being done for our benefit, so we damn well better enjoy it. But I just think we're heading into a little bit of a correction. But after this correction, I'm going to be really psyched to buy stuff. Because, again, it's all being done for our benefit, and they've got no choice but to keep it going. And they will keep it going until it collapses. So when we do get a correction, we're going to be buying like crazy. There's going to be all kinds of opportunities. But until we have that correction, until we see how deep it goes, I don't want to get too heavily invested right now. All right, anyway. Craig says, if everyone's saying the Fed raises these rates in September, do you think there's any chance they surprise with a June hike? No, not now. I, don't, I, I think in June they're going to give a very strong signal that they will be hiking at the uh, – I don't, I don't is, there, is there no meeting between June and September? I think they'll give a very strong signal that they expect to hike at one of the next couple of meetings. So that's the most likely thing we'll hear in June. If we don't hear that in June, I'll be very surprised if they don't make a stronger statement to say – Imminent uh, raising of rates. John says, this conversation about the doom of currencies has me stressed. <laughs> yeah, but it's like global warming. It's like it's going to happen, but, you know, yeah, who knows when. <laughs> it's like, you know, meanwhile, it's good. Let's, enjoy the, uh, let's enjoy the nice sunny weather. Um, yeah, Matthew, oh, you're talking about global warming, too. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, I don't know, John. Uh, when I was a kid, it was um, pollution. You know, in the 60s, it was pollution was going to kill us. And, of course, nuclear war was going to kill us. I, I, I was the last uh, 
my 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 kids kids my age we still did uh get under your desk for the nuclear uh bomb attack uh drills i mean so <laughs> i don't think people can even relate to that now i don't know how old you are but i mean when i was a kid we actually got we actually practiced getting under our desk in case we in case the russians nuked us um that's that was how we grew up <laughs> so um it would just seem it just it's so weird because it's like and that was it seemed imminent at the time right I think um, I think I think global warming is a certain problem. I also think, though, that since the time frame is so slow on global warming, I think that things are going to get bad. But I also think that um, at some point in the next hundred years, we will devise a way to fix to artificially change our own atmosphere, and that we will fix it. All right. So I, I do think that's actually going to be fixed. But not to the point to say you know you shouldn't worry about it. I think we have to part of fixing it is stopping putting carbon into the air and doing things about it. But I think that um, through uh, the various various advances in in um, nanotech and things like that, they'll be able to set up filtration systems that'll pull bad stuff out of the air, and they'll be able to put and and they'll also be able to engineer and put good stuff into the air and do a, a sort of a global rebalancing. But that's got to come with also at the same time you've got to, it's got to also come with um, us changing our ways. You know, just, just because you can clean up the poop doesn't mean, you know, you should keep eating food that gives you diarrhea, right? <laughs> it's, it's a matter of, you know, try, try to, try to like, change your diet as well so we can all get this mess cleaned up. That's where we're at. Um, that, but the financial part, now it's the dollar. No, that's, that's gone. We, we're, we're, we have, we solved, we didn't solve anything. We wallpapered over a global recession that was borderline depression and there are two ways to fix it so there's two ways to fix a depression which we were almost in and way number one is to um create huge government make work projects like uh, roosevelt did in the 30s um and eisenhower did in the 60s also eisenhower uh the interstate highway system in the 50s and 60s was the boom that's why we had such a boom in this country it was a boom for the automakers. It was a boom for the construction companies. It was a boom for housing as we moved all the people out of the, out of the cities, which were horrible. The cities were like tenements. I mean, it's, you know, it's incredible. My, um, <clears throat> my stepfather's parents, you know, lived in the Bronx. And, I, and you, know, I, you know, when I would go back to his apartment, I'm like, how did you live here? You know, I, I, you know, I, I've been, I've been more fortunate in my, uh, with my living choices in my, in my life. I've never seen a place like that. Cause it's like, cause my grand, well, my grandparents and my grandparents in England are fairly well off and they had a nice apartment. <laughs> so, you know, I went, but, but his parents apartment, you know, so, so where my, where my father grew up in England, um, my mom's place I never saw, so I don't know about that one, but my, my father's place in England was where his parents lived. They had a lovely apartment. <laughs> And we had a decent apartment where I lived in, in Westchester at the time when I was a kid. And um, I'm in Rockland. We had a house, so that was nice, too. But these cities, but, but my stepfather's parents lived in what, to me, was like a tenement. It was like a slum. And um, it just blew my mind. I mean, I just had never known anybody who lived in something like that. It was so small and so cramped and so um, – and in such a bad neighborhood – that I just, you know, couldn't get over it. And that's, you know, and if you, if you rewind back to like the 40s and 50s, that's where most people lived. In the, they were jammed into these cities. What happened in the 50s and 60s is we built all these highways and everybody bought a car and moved to the suburbs, which would give you a housing boom and a building boom and a construction boom. And then everybody's buying furniture and then all of a sudden they have TVs and everybody's got to get microwave ovens in the next phase and blah, blah, blah. And that's how you grow that. huge amount of money in building roads that has no immediate payback. It's a, it's a 20, 30, 40-year payback when you start putting highways all over the place, like China's doing now, but they, China went too far into that. China, China spent trillions of dollars building infrastructure, but they built infrastructure with no rhyme or reason. What the United States government did, fortunately, is they took 
you know, they, they took the roads that people were already on and they said, well, let's, let's change this one lane road, well, let's change this two lane road into like a six lane highway. Because everybody like you know, it's always bumper to bumper on this on this two lane road from Chicago to California. So we're gonna we're gonna build a giant highway next to it that lets people do the same thing but much faster. That was logical. And then they'd have a few entries and exits and then suburbs that spring up and so on and so forth. It was done in an irrational manner over the course of decades. That's how you get out of depression though, because the snowball effect of actually putting government money into infrastructure and letting things grow from there is gigantic over time. Um, we, we chose not to do that this time. This time when we had a, a, almost a depression, instead what we said is, you know what, we can pretend we don't have a recession by pumping a huge amount of money into the top of the market. And, we're gonna, and so what we're going to do is we're going to let people pay off their debts with cheaper interest, so they're still going to pay their debts because we're run by bankers, and the only thing bankers care about is getting their money back. So we're going we're gonna to allow our bankers to collect their debts, we're going to let the people pay off their debts by refinancing lower interest rates, and bankers like the refinancing because they get the fees for that too. But the problem is that doesn't help anybody afford new furniture or get a new house or move or have better transportation or build new, or have new cities spring up. It doesn't do any of that stuff. And it also doesn't create jobs. We didn't do any of the things that create a lasting effect. So all we're doing right now is wallpapering over the giant hole that was blown in our economy by the financial crisis. And, and yeah, we've ridden out the worst of it, and we're not going to, if they, if they ripped support out now, we wouldn't go into a depression. We'd probably be in a recession. But we are. We're in a recession. We're in the same recession we were in, and we haven't really turned it around yet. So, you know, I, that's where we are as far as the global economy goes. It's like we still need something. Oh, I read something else that was good in, uh, I, see, I think it was the Financial Times this weekend. Um, somebody was talking about the fact you, you also have to recognize you're, you're getting into a post-growth world. And there's nothing that we learned in economics prepares you for not growing. There's always the underlying assumption of growth is in everything. You know, we, we've never, human beings on the planet Earth have never lived in a time where we weren't growing and expanding as a species. You know, we went from 100 million to 500 million to a billion to 2 billion to 4 billion to 8 billion now. We've got like 7 billion, whatever people we have now, over, you know, hundreds of years. But even so, you told me, really, it's only over hundreds of years. The growth is phenomenal. And we've never, we've never done economics with no growth. And we're into a post-growth society. And, and all the rules of economics are kind of out the window. All the stuff people assume isn't there. And that's another huge problem because we, we're not geared up for that kind of society. We have this assumption of constant growth. We're always expanding, going into new territories, building new things. Um, the only thing that's keeping us alive right now, as far as, as far as the global economy goes, is the growth of the underclass of the third world, and China and India and Africa, you know, like finally bringing those people into the 20th century, even though it's the 21st century, we're just basically bringing them into the 20th century for the most part. But once we do that, once, they, once they're more or less caught up with us, then what? Then, then where are you going to go? Once everybody's got an iPhone, then what? Then you're in an upgrade cycle, but no, no more new stuff. You know, Apple is a gigantic corporation because nobody had a phone. And now that everybody's got a phone. You know, when they sold computers, they weren't such a big company because there was no growth in the computers. But now everybody's got a phone. Everybody in the world pretty much has a phone. Even people in Africa have phones. And that's gigantic growth. That's how you build massive corporations, create millions of jobs, so on and so forth. Something brand new comes along like that. But what's going to happen now as we have an aging population and we have very low population growth and we're not moving into, you know, all the places on Earth are basically full that we're going to be moving to, it's going to be tough, okay? So it's, it's, it's not an easy fix. And... You know, I, I thought that the government should be doing a lot more for infrastructure here. I think we should rebuild the infrastructure we have to make it more efficient. I think we should certainly be pushing for solar energy to take over and, uh, and push solar infrastructure. Yeah, I don't want to be depressing. I'm just trying to give a realistic global outlook. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and, 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 you know, there are things that we could do and we still need to do. Um, but on the whole, I think the biggest problem that we have in the world right now is that we're in a post 
growth, not just post growth, but we're in a post growth and post labor economy. That uh, you know, you know, you can say as cute as you want, but computers are taking over, robots are taking over, and the next hundred years will be the story of robots replacing all human labor. And then you've got to really rethink the whole concept of the economy because it's like, can you, uh, do, you, do you only reward the people who own the robots? Are they going to only be the only people who have money? And then what happens to all the other humans? It, you know, obviously. IBM doesn't, you know, I, you know, the, the 20 corporations in the world that can sit there and hire and, and build all these robots and have them do all these jobs, they don't need you. So once they eliminate the need for 7 billion people out of 8 billion people in the world, what, what do they do with the 7 billion people? Do you say, oh, you guys are lazy because you're not working? You have to rethink the whole concept of uh, how, how, what a person's worth and what you do with somebody and what somebody should do with their time. When it's not necessary for you to do a job, you know, whenever, you know, if, if I don't, you know, if, if, if nobody goes to work tomorrow, people begin to starve, infrastructure breaks down, society crumbles. So obviously people need to work. Um, but what happens when everything is automated and nobody needs to do that? And there's no reason for anybody to get up and start uh, you know, like food's going to be on the table whether you uh, get up or not. Nobody needs to jump up and do something. Nobody needs to go to the factory. Nobody needs to turn on the machines at the plant. Nobody needs to create electricity. It's all being done by machines that are being maintained by other machines and so on and so forth. So at that point, it's not necessary for you to work. And we are so far removed. Now, the easy solution is, it's a very liberal solution, is the easy solution is people can do what you want. Then we should all be artists and poets and, and singers and athletes and whatever, and we should all do what we want, which is really what Greek society did because everything was being done by slaves. So Greek society focused on the arts and the sciences, and the people did whatever they wanted, and they lived a wonderful lifestyle because they had somebody else doing all the labor. But also because they didn't um, – they valued the artists and the poets and the thing, and they paid those people. Those people got money regardless of whether they worked or not or in traditional work. And we need to start doing that as a society. That's a that's big, big picture. But but it's not that big a picture because it really it's your great-grandchildren are going to have to deal with this. So I, I don't know. If we don't start teaching our children to change, how are they going to be able to I think that's a huge mistake we're making. Anyhow, uh, oh, oh, damn, I lost my chat box. What happened? There it goes. Um, all right, so Ad Adolfo says um, we need new Adams created post labor. What happened? Something went really wrong here. What the hell? Wow, I don't know if anybody can hear me, but I got the, my screen just went weird. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Huh. Microsoft, whoa. What is happening? Ah, wait, I think I just was able to do something. Can anybody hear me still? Oh, okay, thanks. I have no idea what's happening. If I had to guess, I think it's going to reboot. I don't know what's going on. But it's, as if, it's as if you're stuck in one of those Microsoft updates and it won't stop. Um, anyway, if you lose me, that's what. All right, so yes, we do have to wrap this up. So John says, we're entering into uh, post-growth, post-labor economy. Um, Replacement, yeah. It is crazy. We have to, we, look, you have to start saying if you're a human being, you deserve a certain amount of uh, a bare minimum that you're going to get to live on. That there's, We have to set a standard and say, this is, what we, this is what you get for being alive and doing whatever you want in life. And you have a place to work, you have a place to eat, you have a place to sleep. If you want more, then you need to contribute. 
But you can't force everyone to contribute when there's no need for everyone to contribute. That's crazy. So eventually we're going to have to start rethinking what capitalism is and how it goes. Anyhow, okay, so NSA can see here for these activities. Yeah, right. All right, anyway. All right, so let's just take a double check on the market. I seem to have control of my screen again. Oh, no, what happened? Ooh, think of swim going man to me. All right, I guess I can't do that. Jesus. <laughs> Something went wrong on Think or Swim. I can't imagine what it was then. Oh, the sound interrupted? Oh, well. Anyway, all right, guys. So due to technical difficulties, we are going to call it a day here. And I'm sorry about the interruption if anybody lost the uh, audio there. But um, we will get back to this next week. I'm still, we still have a long on gold that, I'm, that I've left it active. And other than that, we're uh, hopefully not too much changing the portfolio. So let me take a look quickly. Oh, no, things are getting worse. Okay. So as, as it stands, while I was uh, chatting away, the markets have actually turned down further. And we'll just see how much of a correction we get. The big number to watch is watch for 2.5%. We're past 1.25% now, so we're going to be looking for 2.5% uh, for tomorrow. It's going to be the next bounce level when we get 2.5%, a total of 2.5% from yesterday and today, from today and tomorrow, I mean. Um, once we get to 2.5%, we're going to look for a bounce of 0.5% would be a weak bounce, 1% would be a strong bounce. If we can't make a strong bounce, we could be heading into the 5% correction that we've been waiting for for ages. All right, so we'll see what happens. All right, now see you guys back in the chat room. Thanks.